Hello, this is Samuel Ornelas here from Aguascalientes, Mexico, and you are watching Teacher Learning Cast with Peter Herrera and Benjamin Stewart. Hello and welcome to Teacher Learning Cast, episode number 18, this day, August 11th, 2018. My name is Benjamin Stewart, calling from beautiful Aguascalientes, Mexico. Good morning, everybody. Piri Herrera, also here from Aguascalientes, the heart of Mexico. Hoping you have a nice weekend and uh, you are awake for Teacher Learning Cast 18. As always, a pleasure to share all these uh, comments, these questions, this ideas on air on this is streaming with Dr. Benjamin Stewart and really glad to be able to be part of this adventure. We've got a great show for you today. We've got uh, an interview uh, with Tyson. We're going to talk about academic reading circles, but we want to let everyone know if you want to follow the discussion, feel free to access our page in Facebook. You can find us Teacher Learning Cast in Facebook. Uh, we've got a page dedicated to all the broadcasts that we've done. We have also uploaded in that same page uh, different ways that you can find past videos. So we're trying to keep a repository of all the past videos that we've done so far so that it makes it easier for you to find those, uh, those episodes. So feel free to visit our webpage in Facebook and uh, leave us comments and suggestions. You can also follow us in YouTube. We have a YouTube page dedicated to this live broadcast. And if you're on Twitter, you can use the hashtag TLC at ELT, TLC ELT, and uh, you can find the link to the live broadcast. That's probably the best way to view the live broadcast because it also has a chat there. We're gonna be looking at the chat uh, box here uh, in YouTube and we'll be trying to field your questions as well as uh, PD following questions in Facebook. So feel free to leave uh, questions and comments if you're watching this live and uh, uh, feel free to, again, uh, leave comments and give us some feedback. Right, as always, we've been discussing different topics and, and obviously, as always, this is a, an independent transmission streaming with our opinions on different issues. Uh, lately, we've been discussing about, last week, we discussed about uh, WhatsApp in the classroom. We have discussed about the input and output theory, performance task, and connecting with learners, how to, pick, how to keep English language learners engaged. We've been talking about objectives. We've been talking about evaluation. We've been talking about different aspects uh, according to our experiences and what we've been living in our classroom and different uh, article you run into and, and 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 things that come up so if you want us to uh, retake re-explore or uh put on the table a new topic or something we've seen before just let us know send us a message and we are open to uh retake whatever is necessary and uh try to look for information about whatever you want on education especially english language learning Yes. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and jump into our discussion because I really want to give us enough time to dive into uh, this discussion of academic uh, reading circles. I think reading the reading skill is uh, probably one of the most important skills, especially for language learners who may or may not be accustomed to uh, reading in their mother tongue. But to ask them to read in a target language can be sometimes a challenge. So we're really uh, fortunate today to have uh, Tyson Seaburn with us today to talk about his book, Academic Reading Circles. Hopefully you can see my screen here. This is uh, the book uh, that, uh, that he wrote here that we're going to discuss today. And uh, you can follow Tyson also on his webpage, 4C.ca, 4C.ca, um, Considerations on Collaborative Teaching and Learning. So it's a great blog there. You can find a lot of information about Academic Reading Circles and other information uh, that he is involved with. Um, so Tyson, uh, welcome and thanks for uh, joining us today. Hi, I'm very glad to be here and thanks for uh, asking me to come. So Thank you. joining us, uh, Tyson, it's a pleasure to meet you and excited to hear about. Me too. I always love talking about it. So, uh, you know, it was a great opportunity when you asked me to be on this podcast. 
So before we get into it, I'd like to ask you, uh, Tyson, if you can maybe discuss some of your motivations behind writing the book, maybe give us a little bit of your particular teaching context or maybe a, a problem that drove you to, to sure. write this book. Sure. Um, well, really, the book, the book is the culmination of several years of doing academic reading circles. So it wasn't, um, it wasn't something that I wrote a book and then we started doing things. I, I, obviously, I think that's not usually the way people do things. But um, in terms of my context, I teach at the University of Toronto in uh, the International Foundation Program, which is um, a, it's sort of a mixture between an in-sessional and a pre-sessional EAP program insofar as um, my students, largely from China, uh, my students have uh, been conditionally accepted to the Faculty of Arts and Science. And so they are university students in that sense, and they do come to our program for an entire academic year. Uh, and they take a first year history credit course at the same time as they take three other language and support courses, one of which was critical reading and writing, which was the course I was the lead of for several years, taught in, developed the curriculum, and the academic reading circles developed out of. So in that regard, they, they are attending university courses, so it's not exactly a pre-sessional, but it is kind of a pre-sessional insofar as they're only doing one course, um, aside from the support ones. And basically, reading circles derived out of um, realizing that my students didn't attack a reading in a way that was very engaging. They didn't seem to go beyond a superficial um, once over read of the material. And if they did, they spent a lot of time on vocabulary, you know, looking up each individual word. You know, it's not like an extensive reading program that they have to deal with in terms of the types of text. So they're dense, they're difficult texts, they're long, and uh, they have to be used in their written assignments as well. So they have to understand what's going on in the meat of that text or, or several texts. And when they we're really being superficial about it. We recognize through comprehension questions and discussion that they just really couldn't um, talk about the material to a very deep degree. And as a result, we tried to think of ways in which we could get the students to more actively be engaged readers uh, and look at different parts of a text, sort of the way that I think we all do in our first language, but we don't really realize that we do. So. That's kind of the problem. And then the, the roles for the reading circles uh, emerged kind of reactionary uh, to the problem. And over a series of several years, probably three or four, we experimented in my course with different versions of the roles. And then eventually uh, we found the five that seemed to work the best. And that is where the book ended up coming from. So talking about the roles, so did you collaborate then with other teachers? Uh, can you speak a little bit to how those roles kind of emerged mm -hmm. as the final version of uh, ARC? Sure. Um, so, I mean, nothing's done in isolation. I, I mean, I can't take total credit for having made everything about um, the reading circles on my own, obviously. So I work um, in a team of teachers. And at the time that we started the reading circles, there were probably four of us, maybe. Uh, and one teacher brought in um, uh, some, some handouts and things that she had gone to a session of literature circles. And uh, she thought, OK, well, maybe we can try out something like this with our group. And so we, we took the literature circle roles, which were um, developed um, for a K to 12 sort of first language situation uh, where they would be looking at fiction, you know, and reading fiction sort of in an extensive reading more type of way than an EAP one. And we tried those roles um, sort of verbatim and it just didn't seem to work with the type of text that we were doing. So we, um, the four of us sort of slowly sort of tried to think different things and tried to do different things over that year. And then the team changed the next year and there were another four teachers plus myself and 
um, as the lead of the course, I, I started to think, okay, what can I do to these roles in order to make them work out better for a nonfiction text, either on the popular end or on the scholarly end? And uh, so we started off with kind of the similar roles that we have now in the book, but there was a fifth role or a sixth role called a summarizer. Um, but eventually we realized that um, some of the rules were heavier than others in terms of tasks and we decided really it was time to squish them down to five and five just ended up being the best um, type of um, collaboration, I think, amongst a small group of people. So that is, um, without like specifically listing the roles or going into each role right now, um, unless you want me to, that's sort of how things developed over time. Yeah, so let's dive into those roles if we could. Okay. Um, and I would like, I'll list them briefly, and then maybe you can talk a little bit about um, how, you know, anything unique about each of those five roles. So you mentioned mm -hmm. that uh, the five roles being leader. Mm -hmm. So one, one person assumes a, a leadership role. One person is a contextualizer. Mm -hmm. You've got a connector, a mm -hmm. visualizer, and a highlighter. Well done. <laughs> so... So if, yeah, maybe you can talk a little bit about each one and maybe some <clears throat> insight about either challenges or th maybe uh, experiences that you faced that maybe they gravitate and do better, you know, maybe that mm. it's, maybe it's easier for them to do as, as second language learners. Okay, well, that's a good question as to whether it's easier as a second language learner. Um, I'll, I'll give that some thought as I'm talking through them. Mm -hmm. uh, so the leader, is the person obviously who is going to take control of the in-class discussion um, to a large degree. So just to back up a little bit, um, when the students have a common text among their group that all of them are reading together at the same, um, for the same purpose, uh, each one of the people in the group, five of them ideally, get a different role, as you mentioned, those five roles. Uh, they work on those roles and the duties associated with them individually on their own, usually outside of class. And then um, in a succeeding class, they bring the work that they have found regarding those roles together in an in-class discussion uh, and work through negotiating the meaning and, and sharing the information that they had found um, through the research of their own role, hopefully to co-construct knowledge of that text better than had just one person read it on their own. So in terms of the leader, um, the leader is really the person who is trying to navigate um, the main points of the text and break it down in terms of um, structure. So typically that person is um, going to be dividing the text into sections uh, where they see a sort of sub point and another sub point and another sub point uh, and summarizing that section. Uh, and they also create um, three concept check questions uh, and three discussion questions. Uh, and in the in-group discussion, then the leader is the one who starts off by talking about um, uh, the concept check questions throughout the different sections that they have found uh, and delineated throughout that text. And ultimately, they're trying to gauge a sort of baseline comprehension among their group so that everybody's sort of starting from a similar point in terms of the basic gist uh, understanding of that text. And then they guide the discussion throughout the rest of the hour or hour and a half, depends on how long you're actually doing that in-group discussion. So usually they work through the text from start to finish in terms of uh, here we start with section one, this is what I think it's about, uh, these are some details, there's some examples that um, I found throughout it, and then each person uh, contributes from their perspective, from their role, to things that they found in that section. And then they move on and then they end with the discussion questions. Uh, so that's uh, the leader in a nutshell. I think the leader is um, something that um, the students find a little bit challenging in terms of uh, trying to figure out where main ideas actually are. And I think that's a struggle that all, maybe not just second language learners, but all readers somewhat have some difficulty with, but they get practice with it. Uh, and I, th I think really that's the, the biggest challenge 
not to mention little bits of grammar things like when they make dis your comprehension questions or discussion questions themselves. That's obviously a language issue. Um, the next role I'll talk about then is the visualizer. Uh, and that person tries to represent difficult concepts in a text visually in some sort of way. And hopefully they do so either by creating a graphic themselves to represent that concept, or they source a graphic online that they find from a reliable area. So um, as an example, I am trying to get the students away from really the flashcard style of a visual where you know you you find one word or something like that and then you represent that one word um, with a visual or a photo or something like that that's decorative and that's not really that meaningful i think so we want the students to find a challenging concept in a text it could be a statistic um, it could be um, an event that happened and beyond the words themselves we want them to find either a photo or a video or an infographic or um, you know, some sort of chart, something that is going to represent that a little bit better for the other students. Uh, so I, again, I think the problem area with this one is to get them away from finding useless visuals, things that don't really enhance the learning or the understanding of that concept in the text. And I think a great example of that is when students see a name of a person um, such as you know, Justin Trudeau, and so they bring in a picture of Justin Trudeau, and um, that doesn't really work, obviously, as a visualizer. It's, no, it's not really helpful. So part of the duty then to, to move away from that, which we added on, was we want them to uh, write a little bit of information about the visual that they found, including what's happening in that visual, where it relates to in the text, and how it has been helpful for them to understand. And I think that that has really helped them concretize why a visual like a picture of Justin Trudeau does not um, help them understand better than without that visual itself. Uh, a third role is the contextualizer, and this is my favorite in particular. Uh, but the contextualizer is a person who is looking for contextual references in a text that are mentioned by the author. And they're not only mentioned, but they might not be fully explained very well, but they're there for a reason. And the author is trying to use those contextual references to support some point. But if you don't come with the cultural uh, knowledge that the author brings in um, and assumes the reader shares, then you might overlook that contextual reference or you might not understand why it's there. Uh, so people, places, events, um, quotes from outside sources, those types of things are what we consider contextual references. And we want the students then to find those contextual references throughout the paper. We want them to figure out whether they're explained or not within that paper to a, a degree that you can understand, even if you don't really know who Justin Trudeau is, for example. Uh, and then for all the ones that are kind of not explained very well, um, then we want them to research a little bit about that contextual reference from the internet or from books or things like that uh, and bring that back to the text to try to understand why it was that the author actually included that contextual reference there. And I think the difficult part of this role is really that the, you know, there's a lot of contextual references actually throughout a whole paper. And so it can be really challenging when you have 50 different types of contextual references within a paper to realize which ones are the important ones to take uh, a look at and research more fully and then bring that back into the text and be able to explain who that person is or what that event is or, or um, what that place is and how that's significant to the text to other people. And I think that one causes a lot of, a lot of work for students because they really look up things that may not result in anything useful and it takes some time to really get through that. Uh, fifth, uh, fourth role then is the connector which is something that I think all of us do when we read texts. We make connections to familiar events or familiar things or familiar concepts that we already know um, to the unfamiliar that's in the text that we're reading. So we can try to bridge some understanding for ourselves to uh, make sense of a text that we don't really know much about. And I think students need to be pointed towards this because this is something that speaks to transferability, 
of skills between courses. It speaks to interdisciplinarity between courses. Um, and on a smaller scale, in, in terms of reading, the connector then would try to find something in the text that's a bit unfamiliar, but it reminds them of a news event that's happening in the world, maybe uh, another reading or a concept that's been used in another class, maybe something from the history lecture in our case, uh, maybe even a personal anecdote, uh, something that they're familiar with in their own lives that they can connect this concept to. And so they try to make a few connections and bring those connections to the discussion in order to help other students make those connections as well. I think the problem area with this one is a lot of students initially do want to gravitate towards the analogy or the, the personal anecdote, which is not the least academic sort of connection you can make. Um, so one way around that is to, to have the students try to make multiple connections, not only to the anecdote, but to something that they found in another reading. And when they do that, it really helps the synthesizing skill of, that we need in, in EAP as well, because then, of course, students are trying to find something that's similar or different between two different texts and two different authors, and then understand those things well enough that they can bring those things together eventually in a, in a piece of writing, hopefully. Uh, and then finally, the last role is the highlighter. I think that's the last one. I think I've gone through the others. Um, and the highlighter is the one that sort of morphed a little bit mostly over time. It started out a little bit more trying to highlight, you know, quotes and things like that in, the, in an article and figure out why that quote was used by the author and so on. But that eventually moved into the contextualizer role um, as a contextual reference. So the highlighter ended up turning more into a focus on the lexical items within a text. So in this case, it's a, it's a pretty much a language focused role where a student will look for um, key words or unfamiliar words um, that are used throughout the text in order to sort of build their own topical understanding. And one of the problem areas that we found in writing a lot of times is students would write about a particular topic area like transportation, just as an example, and they would not use the words within the family of transportation very well or at all, and they would um, use the wrong things and so on. And it, it decreases the credibility of a particular student's uh, writing. And as a result, the highlighter, uh, one of their areas is to take a look at the topical words that are used throughout the text uh, and make a little bank of those things. So uh, not only will they learn those words and they'll be able to help other students understand what's going on in that text around those words that they don't know, but ultimately they'll be able to use it in their writing um, if they were to use this text and use this type of um, topic in their, in their writing itself. Um, aside from that, they're, they're looking at things like academic language as well uh, and trying to figure out, based on their preconceived notions of what academic language actually is, they look through a text and try to highlight areas that they think are academic language, um, at least at first, early in the term and we can then correct whether or not that is academic or not. Uh, and then highlighters later in the term who get a little bit more familiar with what academic chunks and academic language actually looks like can then try to source those things in the text themselves and see how it's used in the text by the author and, and um, try to build, again, a kind of bank for themselves and the other students to use in their own writing. Um, I think that's, probably the role that students find the least engaging, actually, or the least interesting. Uh, and I don't know if it's just simply because it's language focused or whether it's because um, it's not the most fun thing to do, I guess. Um, but in feedback, that's the one I've heard from students the most that they don't love doing, <laughs> but it's a necessary one. Right. Tyson, I, I can uh, sense uh, from all this explanation about different roles that they are not really uh, that static roles. It's more like a guideline, and then at the end, whatever. I mean, I see like two <coughs> two main um, uh, areas uh, division in here. Like the work I I do as a team when I connect my role to the other roles, and the work I do my myself. But I don't. I I kind of sense that uh, in both planes. It's not a static. They they can like go beyond their role, or, or uh, is that is that the way that happens? 
Well, I think I think that is the ultimate thing that you want to happen because these are the these roles are sort of distinct um, angles to look at a text that uh, you know we would normally do simultaneously and without thinking. And um, really, what's happened, just like a lot of things that you do in second language learning, where you you sort of isolate something and practice that thing. Um, the idea is that um, we have to sort of explicitly show these are angles that you would look at um, at uh, any kind of text in order to get the most meaning out of it. And once you get practice with one role, then in the next reading circle, the roles shift around that group. So everyone gets a chance at all of the different roles. But of course, having done the leader in, in week one, and now you're the highlighter in week two, you, you don't sort of forget what you did in, in the leader role. And so the idea is through a sort of scaffolded process over a series of weeks and a series of arcs, the students get practice and can combine all of the roles that they're doing at, at the same time. So I think initially it's more individual and it's a little bit more static. Like you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this. And then over time, it it does exactly what you say. You know, it becomes a little bit more fluid. They help each other out. Um, and eventually we want the sort of culminating task is for them in their research projects when they find their own ta uh, texts to actually perform all of these roles individually on, on a paper um, so that they can get the most meaning out of it. Right, and then at the publication, uh, at the publishing stage, when they, when they come to the classroom, they share whatever they did. Uh, I, I mm -hmm. kind of think that's a different dimension of roles, right? They, obviously, they're gonna keep uh, the strength of the role for they had for the assignment, but mm -hmm. once they come as a team, is there a switch again? Like uh, I don't know, uh, uh, roles. Yeah, I I know the part that uh, was assigned in my role, and I have the strength in there. But now that we come as a team in the publishing part, it's a total different situation. You say it like that, or I'm not sure. It's it's a totally different situation. I think that the idea is that they're they're bringing individual things from their role together in a small group discussion to work through that text. All right. Um, and so it's like, it's like one person who's, who's talking about a text divided into five people. All right. uh, and so while the leader would manage the discussion that goes through on, uh, throughout that text, when they're at a particular area, let's say section one of the text, the leader would summarize what they think that's about. And the rest of the students, based on the things that they had read and researched, would have some input and discussion over negotiating whether that's actually true or not. And then if I was the highlighter, I would bring in vocabulary that I noticed in that area because other people weren't necessarily focused on that and try to teach other people, this is the vocabulary that is being used throughout here. And if it came to academic language or topical language in that case, the other people in the group, depending on the time of the year, I think, and the experience we've had with arts, would be equipped to um, criticize or negotiate whether those things were, were correct or not. So I think um, in terms of um, the group discussion itself, they are still very much the individual roles, I think, in that particular group discussion, because um, that's their focus and that's what they want to share and that's what they're the expert about at that particular time. Yeah, um, Tyson, I've got a kind of a two part question. I'm curious about uh, different ways of looking at a text and how they might fall into these five different roles. So let me give you the first example. So if uh, typically when we look at a text, we can look at it in terms of genre, mm -hmm. audience, purpose mm -hmm. and style. So my first part of the question is taking those four aspects how do they fall into the roles or do they fall into the roles that may go maybe just beyond the topic itself of the, of the reading that might go beyond, uh, you know, beyond just what the author is saying? Well, that's um, a perfect point. And that actually the gap, as I tend to refer to it with genre, audience and purpose, that is one of the duties of the leader um, in particular is to, you know, they're really trying to, first of all, create, create a baseline comprehension or establish a baseline comprehension among their group. Um, and one of the ways that contributes to that is for them to uh, think about what is the genre audience and purpose and how does that affect um, the things that the author is saying throughout that text. Um, 
And obviously, you know, those three things um, also contribute to whether something's scholarly or not, whether where it's found, what type of bibliographic reference and so on needs to be created if they're going to use that text. So the leader does in fact look at those things and uses that as part of their handout that they give to each other in the in-group discussion as each person kind of has a little handout that they share with each other. And so I imagine then at the beginning of the discussion, um, they would then talk about, uh, or the leader would at least have the option of talking about what they think the genre audience and purpose is um, as part of that sort of baseline discussion and have the students then also uh, their group mates talk about whether they agreed with that or what features of the text contributed them to thinking it was an academic text or a magazine article um, and so on. So um, <laughs> I'm not sure I answered your question fully, but uh, so, so yeah. So the your the leadership pretty much takes on that role of of the gaps, or I don't know if you've had experience with maybe dividing up each of those four aspects and each student taking on a role and bringing that together into a discussion? Well, I think, I think one thing to keep in mind um, about ARCs is that um, they're never, they've, they've never been meant to be a syllabus of a program, right? So um, they're, they're an activity within a program. And so uh, any of the things that they're doing in the roles themselves, um, I would encourage to have already or have been a part of a teaching lesson within the class itself outside of the arts. Like as an example, um, if you take the gap, for example, we would look at what genre audience and purpose is as a class on a, a variety of different texts um, so that when they do a reading circle, which is just one component of a larger curriculum, they would have some experience already with that. So it's not like, ARC is the teaching tool only that, you know, only the leaders get a shot at it. Um, it's, it's a broader part of a curriculum, or it's part of a broader curriculum, at least I hope it is. And in my case, um, it is for sure. So, okay. yeah. so the second part of my question, and maybe the, your answer would also apply to this, but I just need to throw it out there. Okay. The modes of persuasion, so the ethos, pathos, and logos, is, would that be kind of similar in the sense of really appealing to uh, logos like the organization, the pathos really appealing to emotion, and ethos appealing to the character of the writer versus maybe the, the reader? Is that also part of that more global classroom discussion that you would address as a whole group, or or uh, do you have experience of them kind of exploring those aspects of the writing of of the text as uh, as a group? I would say that they do come out in the more global curriculum, and then those things are practiced within the academic reading circles. Um, I mean, all of them are really also connected to the students finding their own voice and their own writing as well. And so like in my case, it's a, you know, it's a reading and writing course. And as a result, um, a lot of the writing lessons that are not part of the reading circles themselves, because the reading circles is really focused on, you know, engagement and comprehension of a text itself. A lot of the skills that you may be thinking of are also part of the assignments that are attached to the reading circles in some sense which are not really part of the book exactly because um, I didn't want to necessarily prescribe to other people how you have to connect the reading circles to a written assignment. But ultimately that's what we do. Um, and so the students then would, as part of their discussion um, or post discussion, I guess, uh, we have them go to a Google doc and on the Google doc, um, there's a, a list of different types of questions that maybe they have missed out during their reading circles. And some of those things may be the, the organization or the, the emotion that's involved or, or is, there, um, is there something about the author? What did you learn about the author? You know, there's, there's various things that are gonna kind of get left off of certain discussions because students are gonna focus on one thing or they're not gonna focus on another, or you, know, you only have a certain amount of class time to do a live discussion. And so they don't even finish the whole thing. So usually at the end, I try to give the students a space where they can work collaborative, 
collectively on a Google Doc to think about the things that they had brought in their discussion, as well as some other guiding things that um, they may have missed out that I have found. Uh, and then they collate those things together as sort of a lecture notes in a sense. Or, um, and hopefully they can use those as part of their writing assignment later on. Yeah, Tyson, I'm, I'm sensing like a, uh, from what you said, like part of the curriculum, like like it's it's uh, parallel to other other activities in the classroom. I'm mm -hmm. sensing you have uh, a, a schedule classroom hours with the students, but this work goes beyond the classroom and, and beyond the time. Am I right at that? Well, it's true. In so far as the you know the individual role work that happens before the in group discussion is done outside of class. Um, so, I mean, unless you have enormous amounts of time where you can <laughs> you can allow students to do some of those things in class. Um, it's typically homework. And I find it better because then the students, obviously, they can work at their own pace. Um, so I mean, I'm afforded a certain luxury because I do have 24 weeks in my program. Mm -hmm. um, most of the reading circles are done in the first 12. But um, in terms of the scheduling, for me, it tends to work out best where you have one arc kind of every two weeks. Um, because I only meet my class twice in a week. And we would assign the reading in, in say, week A, give the roles to everybody in week A, and in, then in week B, they would come together with all of their group discussion um, and research that they had found on that um, over for homework, talk about it, and then um, that would happen in week B. And then we'd do a new one in week C and D and so on like that. So. Yeah, yeah. My comment was uh, going precisely towards this: how much do they really engage? In, in my experience, uh, uh, some students tend to leave everything for the end, and it looks to me like with this with, with this uh, arc, uh, there is no there is no chance to leave everything for the last minute because you have yeah. things to do on your own and things to share with others, and at the end you come up to uh, gather and have a final grouping up of everything we've done so uh absolutely yeah there's there's like a you know there's a kind of built-in pressure because it's not just themselves right there's four other people that are relying on them um and it, you know if that fourth person doesn't bring anything to the discussion there's a you know um it's sort of embarrassing for them i would say okay. and um you know there are little other checks and balances in place depending on how you do things as a teacher um, so, for example, the leader, whenever I assign a leader role, one of their responsibilities is to send me the three concept check questions and the three discussion questions that they have created uh, two days ahead of the in-class discussion. So I can kind of take a look at them and see if they're going to produce any meaningful discussion or whether um, they're totally off base in terms of establishing that baseline. Um, comprehension with their group. So that's kind of one example of a check and balance. And then um, while I haven't done this with other roles, you could do that ahead of time with other roles. Of course, I think that would put a lot of strain on a teacher's time. Um, however, post discussion, they have a checklist um, of all the things that um, the students need to do for a particular role. And ideally, they would check off those things before they got to the group discussion. Um, but after the group discussion, um, they have an opportunity as a group to go through that checklist and talk about or reflect on how well they did each of those things. So while um, you know, the contextualizer might uh, just do a check mark ahead of time uh, saying, yes, I have found three contextual references and explain them. Post in class discussion, they would go through that checklist and evaluate each one of those contextual references in terms of how good it was or how useful it was um, with an A, B, or a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 kind of system. So there's a reflection built in as well that I think contributes to um, students feeling right. like they have a responsibility. Yes, yeah, th that was in fact the, 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 the the leading of all of these uh, uh, comments, like, do you have any reference of how they they feel during the process? Like, because we're talking about 
the work they do, uh, uh, maybe a little bit of extra time, the commitment, different paces, different speeds, different uh, levels of uh, comprehension maybe from each of them. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have a reference of how they feel during this process? Well, I think initially they're, they're overwhelmed. I mean, I, because there's a, certain, there's a certain workload that's attached to this. Of course, it's a university course. So, you know, you kind of take what you get with the university <laughs> course in a sense, right? You know, but uh, I think that um, the students like the opportunity in a reading writing class, particularly, to speak and to talk about their ideas. Because when, when you're in a class that is focused on reading and writing, It, there, it's not such a, it's not such an out loud opportunity, uh, and so I think they get from the reading circles a sense of satisfaction that they've been able to talk about a text for 60 to 90 minutes in an L2 um, and in an engaging way to a certain degree or other. So it builds some confidence. It also, I think, after the first few, once people start getting better at the roles, um, they start to recognize the value of actually having someone else contribute uh, different understandings of meaning throughout that whole text. When, when they had read it by themselves, they just they didn't really understand anything at all or didn't understand a lot of it. Um, and then ultimately when they have a, you know, a quiz, a comprehension quiz about that text or short answer questions about that text, or eventually they're using that text in their own writing, that's where it pans out um, in terms of the biggest amount of um, satisfaction, I think, because without the reading circles, they wouldn't have understand it well enough and they wouldn't have been able to use it in the writing and they would have gotten lower grades. Mm -hmm. you know? So if, even if grades are a motivation, um, then that ultimately is where it, it ends up. Uh, what, what can help them at the beginning? If anybody wanted to, to start with something similar, like this kind of, uh, teamwork and individual work, teamwork and uh, workload towards reading, which is going to have a little bit of investment from the teacher and the students. What do you think would be something that motivates everybody to go on with this at the beginning? Which, I mean, I kind of sense what you just said at the end, that towards the end, you can see all the benefits mm -hmm. and, and, and more because it's something you've been doing mm -hmm. and you have uh, proof of Uh, of what's the outcome of this. And then at the end, the outcome, obviously uh, it, it's a great uh, opportunity of um, enriching students' uh, self-esteem on, on whatever they achieve. But what about at the beginning? What is the facing? What, what would you recommend as something to motivate this to go on? Well, there's a, I mean, there's a couple of ways you could go about this, depending on which you prefer. I mean, Ultimately, for any learning experience, I think you have to um, identify a gap in knowledge before you can show anybody that anything's worthwhile learning. Um, so, you know, you can do that in a, in a sort of shock value punitive way, or you can do it in a sort of more constructive way. It depends on how you like to do things in your class. Both have value. I'm not judging. Um, but, you know, you could give a comp you could give a a sample text to the students right off the get-go and quiz them on it, and they all fail or do quite terribly on it, that alone sort of shows the need, okay, we need to do something in order to motivate you to not get a 35% on the test again about a particular quiz. I mean, that's the sort of punitive shock value way. Um, otherwise, I think, again, because this is, As I said, part of a broader curriculum, um, I would imagine that at the beginning of a term, it would be necessary to bring in a text of some sort, have a little bit of discussion about it, and the students recognize that they're not able to really answer that question. They're not able to um, give their opinion very clearly about it because they didn't really understand that text. Um, or, um, I was going to say something else, but it just slipped my mind. <sighs> It'll come back to me. But um, ultimately, I think really it is identifying a gap in knowledge. And, you know, a lot of students find reading kind of boring. And so, you know, you can also suggest, you know, if, if reading this text in class and then doing a couple of comprehension questions is a boring approach to reading in a classroom, um, 
let's try something different. Let's try something where you are, in, in fact, um, all engaging with the text uh, and talking about that text, and you're able to really understand it. And it's different. You don't just have to, you know, pre-teach vocabulary, then do the reading, then have a series of comprehension questions, then have a couple discussion questions, which is a, you know sort of typical PPP-ish style um, way of approaching reading. Let's do it in a flipped classroomy type of way where you do some things on your own, we'll bring it together and we'll spend the majority of the class actually talking about the reading instead of just simply testing it. So maybe that's motivating. <laughs> Yeah, I like, uh, Tyson, how you, in the book, you talk about the, uh, the procedure, the, R the ARC procedure as being a cycle. And I mm. like specifically how at the end of the discussion, of the end of the group discussion, you ask students to write these kind of reflective questions that then are, are passed forward to the next person who will assume that same role. The idea mm -hmm. being that they take these uh, these, the cycle where they go through the whole process several times reading different texts and assume, so they have a chance to assume different roles throughout mm -hmm. the process. Um, I'm curious about the products that they create per each process. So I know that they have discussions. I understand in the book you recommend 60 to 90 minutes of group discussion. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of time there where there's, a, there's interaction uh, between the students Mm -hmm. that as they assume those roles but towards the end what kind of evidence do you require that you that you want from the teacher to um rely on to really see whether or not they understand uh, the text and what to what degree is there differentiation in your instruction in the sense that they give uh, they have the power to choose what kind of products that they end up uh, uh creating that's a very good question. Um, I'll tell you at least what I do, and then um, I, I think there's variance as to whether what products are produced, um, depending on what the purpose of your course is ultimately. In, in our case, um, the students, aside from the checklists, which I have mentioned before, um, and the reflection that you have just mentioned, which is actually part of that checklist, um, the students have to produce a, a, an attractive yet informative handout to give to each of the other students based on the role that they have done. This I find um, enlightening in a few ways. Um, one, it, it is all based on their pre-group discussion. Uh, so you're not getting an example of a product um, of the negotiated meaning and the co-constructed knowledge at that point, but you are getting a sense as to whether that student understood um, the role that they were focusing on and the material um, that comes out of that particular role because you have the students, of course, exchange those handouts with each other before the group discussion happens so that when they get to a point in the text where it's relevant to look at the handout, they have it. Um, but I also get one myself, so I can see what they look like, um, and I can correct or identify areas where maybe I think, you know, um, X student who was the connector didn't make such a great connection, or this connection is inauthentic, or it's false even. So when I'm walking around the room listening in on some of the discussions, I can interject at a certain point, um, hopefully, um, and try to talk with the students about that particular connection that they had made. So I think in, on one regard, the product is that, um, that handout uh, in terms of identifying sort of an individual understanding whether they understood the text. The second product, as I said, um, I kind of briefly mentioned before was after the group discussion is over, then I have Google Docs um, pre-made for each one of the groups and on that Google Doc um, there's a list of their names at the top with the, each of the roles that they did then there's a bunch of blankish areas where I want the students to work on the Google Doc hopefully synchronously and together at that moment where they think about the things that had happened in the discussion and informed uh, their understanding of the text 
So one of those things, just as an example, is they, as a group, need to identify the gap of that text, like the genre audience purpose. Another thing is they have to write out the bibliographic reference as a group, for example. Um, another area is by role, they need to um, answer a sort of focused question by role. So um, one of those would be, you know, visualizer, um, put in one of the visuals that you found, talk about uh, what's happening in that visual, how it connects to a part of the text, what your group thought um, about the, the relevance of this uh, visual according to that text, and what was what is the text about at that area that you think this visual is a part of. Um, so each role sort of takes ideas, hopefully that are informed not only by what they had talked about or sorry, not only by what they had researched in their individual work, but then in their group discussion, if they realized that this visual was useless, that wouldn't be the visual necessarily that they would put on this Google Doc and talk about, right? And if they did, then I would be able to understand whether or not they had actually, you know, uh, figured out uh, some of the concepts in that text because they, they chose out of the three visuals, for example, the one that was the worst one, and I would go, okay, well, they didn't really understand it. Or if they chose a really good visual, then I would get a better sense of them actually um, improving their understanding of that particular area of the text. Uh, and then another area of that Google Doc, I have them uh, try to, in our case, connect whatever the theme or the main ideas or the concepts of that text were about to a research project um, that is a writing assignment in my course as well. Uh, so I can see whether or not they understood um, something from the core text that they can connect to the research project that is um, they have to write about later on. And then the last part of that Google Doc is an area where students as a group can identify any doubts they have about that text, any questions they have about that text, any grammatical issues that they found throughout that text that they don't understand. And then I can go on to that Google Doc either in class while they're actually doing it or project it, or I can do it after the class is over, which is most often what I do, uh, and leave comments throughout that text about problem areas or you know, good things that they had found, and address some of the questions that they have in that bottom area. So those are the sort of two products, really, that I require of my class to do. I think the handout is necessary as part of any ARP, but the Google Doc is just sort of something we came up as, OK, instead of just finishing the group discussion and then, boop, it's over, let's try to figure out a, a way to, for you to use what you have found in that discussion um, on some kind of written text. And like I said, ultimately, all of these arcs contribute to a broader writing assignment that they have to do in their course as well. So arcs themselves, I'm not really interested in marking them so much as I feel they're a means to an end um, uh, and more of a scaffolding activity than an assignment itself, per se. Yeah, you mentioned this uh, final writing assignment, and maybe my next question, is, which is related to this, is uh, involved in that final writing assignment. But you've given a lot of good examples, I think, about how students take a text and really analyze it. I'm curious about the the synthesis part, and I'm I'm wondering if you know they take these common texts, and I'm assuming then over the course of a one particular uh, class, they will have seen several types of common text. I'm mm -hmm. wondering if the if you have any exercises or if how ARC kind of is involved or could be involved in the synthesis part where maybe those groups look at a series of texts and kind of compare and contrast those different texts. And then maybe if that is part of this final writing assignment where they're having to, you know, take this because obviously that's what they usually have to do in a writing assignment is compare and contrast different sources or different articles, mm -hmm. for example, how, how, and based on your experience, how do students exercise both the analysis part and the synthesis part through ARST? Well, ultimately, in the idealist situation, um, each of the texts that you use or you select for ARC would contribute or be useful for this writing assignment that they end up having to do. So there would be some at least indirect, but probably hopefully direct connection. And that's actually really hard 
um, because you want to give students a certain amount of choice in terms of what they write about um, for a research project, ultimately, in, in, a, in a course. But at the same time, you want each of these art texts to contribute so that um, you're sourcing some text for them and they're not just left to their own devices to find all the text on their own. So um, if I talk about an example from my own course, uh, like a few years ago, we had an assignment, it was a Toronto assignment, um, uh, which is just for practical reasons where we live. And the students needed to identify a problem in, or problematize something in Toronto. Um, it could be about transportation, it could be about parks and recreation, it could be about nearly anything. Uh, and then um, ultimately write a research paper based on identifying this problem, arguing for some sort of type of solution to it or recommendation and then supporting that with facts and so on. So you ended up with a research paper. And then um, the arcs themselves were texts chosen by me or my group uh, on various subtopics of Toronto. Like one would be about transportation, one would be about, um, like I said, parks. I don't know, I'm just going with the same subtopics here. Um, but the idea was then that the arcs would not only show them how to read a text deeply and engage with that um, more meaningfully, but also um, help them sort of determine which subtopic of Toronto for this assignment that they wanted to use so that they could use that text uh, in their actual writing assignment later on. So that was kind of one way to go about it. And um, eventually, I think in the most ideal situation, which is what we're still trying to work towards, is to have each one of those arcs as a core text that could be useful for every writing assignment. And as a result, then, they would be able to um, take ideas from one text, find where they're useful or compared to in another text by another author, and bring that together in a sort of literature review type of sense that would go into their paper. At the moment, um, I find that is, is actually incredibly challenging to find enough texts that are um, usable for ARC, but also all on the same topics that every student can use. So that's a challenge on my part. Um, so a lot of the time, the students um, use one of the core texts from, one of the common texts from ARC, then they source their own texts beyond that. Uh, and we have them as part of the scaffolded um, written assignment. One, one step would be to write a literature review where they would need to then take that um, idea from the common text out of one of the arcs at least and connect it with ideas that they had found in two or three other texts on their own. So I think, um, I think to answer your question more directly, arc itself doesn't have a necessary spot in it where it is forcing students to um, synthesize from multiple arcs, because I think on a, in many case scenarios, teachers aren't using texts that necessarily are connected to each other for each one of the arcs. So it's a little hard to say that you have to do that. But um, really, the connector role, if I was gonna pinpoint something, the connector role then is probably the most likely to do something like that, because they're making a connection potentially between ideas in the in the common text and some other text that they have read be that from another course or um you know even a newspaper article or some something um so uh building that connection is a type of synthesis and so that's probably where it is the most embedded into the art process itself right um so I think uh, as always time is catching up, but uh, mm. I wouldn't I wouldn't like to to get to the end without giving you Tyson the opportunity to put on the table whatever you consider um, whatever you don't want to be uh, just in the air because I know we tend to ask a lot of questions right and then, <laughs> well <laughs> uh, different paths, but is there I appreciate the questions. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, me, me too. I'm, I'm the question guy. <laughs> and uh, but but then and and then Benjamin has. 
another approach for, for his questions, but I, I, I would like you, if there's anything like core, like, uh, well, not like core, but like um, something that you want, don't, don't want to leave on the air, something that, 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 uh, that it's, that it's the, I don't know, the pinpoint, the, the keys, the, yeah. the aspects that you always put on the table for us to keep the thought about the arcs. Well, I think, I think one thing that the students tend to struggle with or not see the face value of initially is the ultimate purpose of the arcs. Like they, they do tend to isolate individual tasks and individual courses and, and not necessarily grasp the larger picture. Um, and so I think it's important um, for teachers to try to embed arcs in a larger process, not just um, you know, we're learning reading for the sake of reading and therefore uh, we're going to do these reading circles. Like, that's great. I mean, if you buy my book, it's wonderful, you know, all said <laughs> that. But um, I really think that the arcs are a means to an end and um, the arcs should be something that's part of a larger curriculum. And the students then should be aware of how the arcs fit into that larger curriculum. And what is the rationale? for using the arcs. It's not simply just to improve the reading ability. I feel it should be something that is leading somewhere. Um, and if that somewhere even only is that eventually you're gonna read a text on your own and perform all of these roles simultaneously yourself, that is the goal, then that's one thing. You know, That's sort of the simplest reason or rationale for using arcs. But ultimately, I think the better reason is, is that these arcs are helping you to do something like a writing assignment eventually. So that's one thing that I would really pinpoint and say. Um, another thing that I think is valuable is that you don't simply usually walk into a class and say, okay, today we're going to do arcs. You know, same as today we're going to do past tense. You know, it's, that's very decontextualized. And so I think that. Um, the teacher should scaffold um, the roles or the duties that are in these arcs assi assignments instead of just like, here, you're the visualizer, you're the contextualizer, you're this, you're that, go to it. Um, I tend to use each of the skills that are in each of these roles as a separate lesson. Um, so, you know, <clears throat> the fact that you're researching a contextual reference um, leads to skills like, well, how do you research? How do you find that information online? How do you determine whether something's a reliable source? How do you then write about that contextual reference? How do you cite it? You know, there's a variety of skills that um, sort of stem out of each of the, the roles in a sense. And so I think that um, it's important for the teacher to do lessons on top of these roles and model each of the things that are happening in each of these roles for the students. And that's not easy, you know, um, because it, it does tend to be a part of a larger curriculum. So um, I guess those would be kind of two points that I would mention. OK. Um, well, we're, we are closing in on an hour here, and we don't want to take up uh, more of your time, Tyson. We really appreciate you uh, giving us this uh, really informative discussion. I'd recommend everyone to uh, buy the book. It's a, it's a really good resource. I myself get a lot of ideas. In fact, a lot of ideas that I want to try to implement this semester in my writing class. Awesome. And um, so, but yeah, Tyson, thank you very much for, for joining us today and uh, talking about academic reading circles. I had a great time. I, and, I have one right in front of me here. Just, this is, just so you get a, you know, a tactile sort of version. Of what this right, right. Like. <laughs> I, I opted, I opted for the Kindle version, but either way, yeah. it's all good. It's all good. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, so if those of you who are watching a recording, feel free to leave us feedback, post your questions in Facebook. Uh, let us know what you thought of today's show. If you have any questions or experiences using Academic Reading Circles, do share. Uh, Teaching Learning Cast is all about community, sharing experiences. And so feel free to uh, leave comments. If you ever want to be a part of the show, let us know. Reach out to us. We'd be happy to program um, more teachers in our live broadcast. So, Pity, thank you very much as well. And any closing statements? 
Yeah, well, yeah. Thank you for for joining us today. I'm always glad to to talk to to people that try these things that that come up with with different uh, uh, with different approaches, with different strategies, with different uh, uh, things to try in the classroom. Would give us ideas, but more than that, uh, I always enjoy. And Tyson, I, I could tell that from you too today. I always enjoy to see how your passion for what you do is projected mm. in your comments because it's not it is not something that you can uh, uh, talk out of your feelings about of what you do every day and, and and we could tell that from you as we've been doing from the guests we we have had before and I think that's that's an extra that's a plus for everybody that is watching this video that uh, uh, you can tell how you can enjoy things no matter how hard they are, if you go and you try them in your classroom. Great. I, I totally agree with you. And I think that reading is, I mean, reading is a passion. Writing is particularly as well. But I think that, as, a, as you mentioned, a lot of people are dispassionate about how to teach it, or it seems something, something's just kind of boring in class, but there's not, there's better ways to do it. And hopefully people will find that this is one of them. Yeah, that's the key. I think uh, sharing your experiences, you've chosen to write a book. I think anytime teachers who are in the trenches writing books, I think always provide a, a, an informative perspective. And, and uh, certainly you've done that uh, with your, your current work. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone. And uh, I think we'll go ahead and conclude today's broadcast. Thank you very much for watching, and we will see you in the next broadcast. Keep on learning.